Good morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you find yourself in the world right now. Thank you so much for joining this live broadcast with me today. Um, today I have Jue Kelvin, who is a uh, Kenyan filmmaker, <clears throat> and he's a student at uh, Kenyana University. And Intellectual Scum, which we will be discussing today, is his third professional project that he's done. Um, we're here today because it, it's a really exciting time, I think, in the creative arts. Because um, if you recall, as viewers, um, there was an article that went out in 2012 that went completely viral. And Jua today is here to discuss it. Jua, you're welcome. Thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate it. And thank you for giving me the honor of being the very first person to interview you. This is a feather in my cap. <laughs> yeah, you're the first person to write the article, so you're the first person to interview us. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> So yep. I mentioned um, that you have two other films um, that you've created. The first one is Stinky Ribbon, and the second one is Sadia, which means uh, help in Kiswahili. And they are award-winning. Can you tell us a little bit about the awards that you won for these films? Uh, yes. Uh, my first film that I did was Ticking Ribbons, uh, which we did in 2013, the last few months of 2013. And then last year, it went ahead to win an award at the Zanzibar International Film Festival. So it won the best East African talent at the Zanzibar. Then uh, the second one we did, which was Still was last year, 2014, uh, was called Saidia, which means help in English. Uh, we shot it on an iPhone, actually, so it was really a big achievement for us. It went ahead to win uh, Best Young Director at the Modern Day Slavery Short Film Competition. Yes. That's excellent. And um, yeah. I asked you a little bit earlier, where will these films be available for people to watch? Uh, right now, they are not available online, but we are working to have them on our Vimeo channel uh, very soon. In the next around two or three weeks, we'll have them up. So anyone from anywhere in the world, you can log on to our Vimeo channel and you can watch them. What is the name of your Vimeo cha channel? Uh, right now, I, I have a Vimeo account, which is Njue Kevin. That's my name. Uh, so I'll upload them to the channel, uh, to my handle, which is Njue Kevin. Excellent. We'll be on the lookout yes. for that. So yes. let's get into uh, the meat and bones of this project, which is Intellectual Scum. <clears throat> and Intellectual Scum, if you remember, right now it's um, it's posted online on my blog, Mind of Malaika. But this article, which was written by Field Rue, went viral, completely viral. <laughs> Literally, you could not go anywhere on the internet without <laughs> finding this this thing. Um, <laughs> For me, the impact for me as a blogger was huge. I made the decision. I what happened is I I got it in an email from a friend of mine. It was so biting, so surgical in the way he wrote it that I was like, I just posted it as it was. Didn't put any of my comments or anything. I just posted it, and it became a magnet for people to find my blog. And within the first month, it had um, garnered uh, over 125,000 views in one month. Whoa. And then um, it's still it's still a draw for people to come to my blog, and also it's the highest commented blog I have. It's uh, right now holding at 812 comments and counting. And anybody else who has a blog that has posted it has seen the same sort of effect. Um, tell me about how this article, um, Intellectual Scum, affected you when you first read it. Uh, I'll start by saying it came to me by chance. So uh, it was a school project. So the lecturer walked in class. Uh, he gave us a link to your blog and told us, go read this article, write a report. It will be part of your exam. It's five marks. So I went ahead at home, just logged in, read it. And the first thing that came to my mind, this is absolutely true. I felt the article was absolutely truthful to what really happens here in Africa. So when I wrote my report and took it back to the lecturer, amazingly, I was the best in class. So out of five, I got four and a half. And that's when I said, this is a movie I want to make because it touched deep down my heart. I think uh, the characters in the, in, the, in the story are really truthful, really deep. 
and as much as some people will not like to hear the truth, it's actually the truth. So that's where it all began. Right, absolutely. And when you're talking about um, some of the subject matter that was in the um, the story that he wrote, so let's just give um, our viewers a little bit of background about it. So, <clears throat> can you still hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I can okay. hear you. Great. Mm -hmm. So the the two uh, protagonists in the piece are um, who we assume are Field Rue, and um, he's the author of the book, and a white man named Walter. And Walter is sitting um, on a plane, and they are on a flight from L.A. to Boston, which is cross-country. It's, it's a long flight. Um, and so Walter just begins to go into this missive about, about Africa, how the only thing that we deserve are crumbs. Um, we just allow people, white people, to come to Africa and take whatever they want. They take the catfish, we get the tilapia, and we have an appetite for crumbs. We really don't want good things for ourselves. And, you know, he, Walter, or Fields uh, responses, you know, that's not kind and it's not nice. And so Walter tells him, but it's true. And, um, you know, he, he Walter talks about the kinds of things white people say about Africans behind closed door, closed doors. And um, so, for example, he says, um, he's talking about America. He's looking over it, and he glances admirably. I'm just going to read a piece. That's white man's country, he said. We came here on the Mayflower and turned Indian land into a paradise, now the most powerful nation on earth. We discovered the bulb and built this aircraft to fly us to pleasure resorts like Lake Zambia. I grinned. There is no Lake Zambia. He curled his lips into a big smile. That's what we call your country. You guys are as stagnant as the water in the lake. We come in our large boats and fish your minerals and your wildlife and leave morsels, crumbs. That's your staple food, crumbs. The cornmeal you eat, that's crumbs. The small tilapia fish you call campenta is crumbs. We the Buanas whites, take the catfish. I am the Buana and you are the Muntu. I get what I want and you get what you deserve, crumbs. That's what lazy people, Zambians, Africans, the entire third world gets. I mean, yeah, wow. that, <laughs> that that was powerful, and uh, uh, you, that's what really touched my heart in this article. That Walter had the guts to call us lazy, to call us Africans lazy, and for some reason, it's true. And it depends with how you look at it. You know, uh, it depends whether you want to hear the truth or you want to continue lying to yourself. And as he said, we Africans uh, take the carpenter, which is the small fish, I, I think, in Zambian. Uh, here in Kenya, we call it omena. Mm. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's the daga fish, I think. It's really tiny fish. And them, the whites, or the, the, the buanas, take the tilapia, which is very big fish and very prestigious. And if you look at it, that's what's really happening in the world right now. Uh, you know, the, the white uh, are really dominating in all fields, sports, technology, you know, education. They're really at the top of the of the pole, and we Africans are still struggling to catch up with the rest of the world. And yes, it's true. I, I absolutely believe Walter was very truthful. Mm. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> there were a few people that had criticisms. Um, which I'm sure you you also heard as well, and I'd love for you to talk about that. Yes. Criticisms about the interaction between Walter and Rue. And mm -hmm. they said that, you know, as as a man of means, as a man of, of intelligence, he should have been able to answer Walter and, and defend African, I guess, honor, which he was mm -hmm. unable to do. Um, mm -hmm. And so that stung for a lot of people that he wasn't able to give a response. But, you know, but in the face of such biting truth, it's kind of hard to do that. And later on exactly. down the line, um, to go to the title of the film that you created, Intellectual Scum, he talks about how the Africa's intelligentsia are, are essentially the reason that we are where we are. So tell us a little bit about your view on that. Um, I don't think uh, Rue the black guy in the plane failed to defend himself because Walter was too offensive or, or Walter was too strong for him. I think he failed to defend Africa because there's really nothing to defend because Walter is talking the truth. You know, he, this is someone who comes and tells you the hard truth. He comes and gives you the, you know, what we don't want to talk about. And you, you have little to defend yourself 
on. And I think that's, uh, that's very truthful of the writer of the article, which is Field. I think he did an extremely good job in, in, in creating that character as someone who really doesn't respond. Because in the essence, we Africans don't respond when someone offends us. When we are oppressed, we don't respond. We just keep quiet and wait, you know, from, from manna from heaven, if I say so. True. <laughs> now, you mentioned Field. Um, talk to us about how you connected with him. You, you, came, you found the blog because your professor said, hey, go to this website and read this and do a report. How did you connect with the author of the of the piece, and then how did it become a film? What was that journey like? Uh, uh, so after I read the article, after I loved the article, and after I made the decision this is something I want to make into film, I went and you know googled your name, uh, and uh, I got results. I got your Twitter handle. So I don't know whether you remember this, but I asked you for the author of the article. You told me you're not the author, but you linked me to the daughter of Ruel on her Twitter handle. So yeah. I asked I, I yeah. her and she gave me the dad's email address. So it's back in 2012 November, if I'm not wrong, that's when I first emailed Ruel and told him I'm really intrigued by your article and I want to make it to a film. And uh, we had a conversation for long and, you know, the one thing he told me is let me not lose track of what the article is all about. Let me not get deviate away from the article as most film adaptations are. If you, you know, just all the films you've watched that are adaptations, most tend to get away from what the original piece was. So he told me specifically, you have to make this as authentic to the article as possible and I think we connected a lot uh, we had a few chats on email you know we've never met because I'm in Kenya and he's in Boston <laughs> but but we talk we talk on email so he he told me you know go ahead make it and be as authentic as possible so the the, the making of the film itself was a whole different experience this was the first big project I did you know we had to find a plane to shoot in so it was really, really tough. <laughs> wow. So how did how did you find a plane? L tell me about that, because that's <laughs> insider stuff that, you know, how did that happen? <laughs> well, I'll be honest with you. Uh, a day to the day we were to film, just, you know, the previous day we were to start filming, in the morning of this particular day, we didn't have a plane. Wow. You know, not, <laughs> the size that, not the size that we wanted. We had a small plane. It was around seven-seater. And considering the journey in which the story takes place, that will be too small of a plane. So that morning, I went to the to the Kenya Airport Authority, which I'm really proud of. They really helped us. So that's where I went, you know, found a few people. I was linked to someone who owned a plane. So I met the owner, and that's how it happened. It was so, it's a miracle, a Christmas gift. That is a mis Christmas miracle. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, the film is actually a short film. It's 15 minutes long, um, which I think is absolutely brilliant. Um, perhaps in time it will become a full-length feature film. But I think yeah. that within that 15 minutes, it will definitely be impactful and stay true to the message um, that Field was, was getting out, which is our responsibility as filmmakers, as writers, as accountants, as whatever you know, field of, of, of education and profession that you've taken as Africans to propel the continent forward. Um, but I, I wanted to know, you know, has anybody had anything, I guess, negative to say to you in trying to bring this film to light? Has anybody said to you, you know, this is is a, a horrible criticism as us as a people. Why would you want to promote this? Exactly, yeah. I, I did face that a lot before I shot the film. You know, I was going to people asking for funds to help me shoot the film. And they're like, why did you have to choose this particular article? You're a black person yourself, and the black person on the plane is being attacked. Why would you do that? And I'm like, you know, I want to tell a story. I want to tell something that's real. And as you said, you writers, filmmakers, accountants, it's all of us to tell the African story and get ourselves from this deplorable state, if you allow me to say so. 
So uh, I really faced lots of challenges in making the film and people really didn't want to associate with the article considering the criticism the article also garnered. As much as there was praise for the article, I think there was also criticism for the article. So people didn't want to look at the, at the positive side. There's a way we human beings are, are, are designed to only see the negative side of things. So I chose to remain strong and look at the positive side. And we're absolutely grateful to you for that. Thank you so much for st staying the course because, you know, it's so easy to get deflated when people are telling you, no, 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 this is a bad idea. So kudos to you. Um, you know, and, and we talked about, or you talked a little bit about, you know, black people not wanting to hear the truth. Um, and I actually had an interesting conversation with um, someone I've never met. He's very influential on Twitter. His name, uh, handle is Pa Eichheit. And you know, he he said something that he said something that a lot of people think but don't want to say out loud because it's easier to blame colonialism and white people and things like that. Um, and he talked about how somebody like Walter, yes, they come to Africa, they take, they take, and they take. But what about what we Africans are doing to each other? He said he's tired of hearing about what white people are doing. And I think about it, and a friend of mine actually uh, terms it as the white agenda in blackface. So I think about my own president, for example, for example my, my current government that has been completely you know, wasteful and mismanaged our resources. And now we've gone from hippic status to now we're begging the IMF to funds, for funds. Do you feel like this is, um, and that's one of the things that a lot of people who read the article who were African, regardless of where they were from, said that they felt like this, you could take um, Field and he could be from Nigeria, he could be from Gambia, he yeah. could be from anywhere. Yeah, from any country in Africa. So do you, do you feel as though, you know, we have ourselves to blame or do you think colonialism is still a valid reason to, you know, for where we are right now? Uh, I'll go the Walter way and I'll say it's not, it's no longer about colonialism. You know, as he says in the article, as well as on the film, you know, he tells Rue not to blame colonialism. Let him give a better response as to why we're still the way we are. And uh, at the end of the article and also at the end of the film, uh, Rue says something really, really interesting. And he says, we Africans ourselves are the reason to blame for what we see. We are the people who elect the leaders that we have. You know, like the number one reason I think Africa is in such a deplorable state, it's because of our political choices. Hmm. You know, we, we, make, we make the choices. It's not a white man that comes from let's say a random country like Britain or, or the US and just comes and makes the votes for you. It's you, the African person, that cast your own vote. And he says, we intellectuals, we who have studied architectures, lawyers, um, you know, filmmakers, authors, you're the brains here in Africa, so you're the people to lead the rest of us in making the right choices. So I think it's, it's more of a political problem than it is um, a colonialism problem. You know, some of the African countries gained independence 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. So that's not a reason anymore. Yeah, it's not. I mean, Ghana, for example, is turning 58 next week. And at the age of 58, you know, we have entire portions of the country where people don't have running water. We were just hit by cholera. We just had to borrow electricity from one of our neighbors so that people could watch football matches. I mean, these are the decisions that leaders right now are making. And we can't say, oh, it's the Queen of England's fault that we are where we are. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So it's so, we, we, we Africans are the reason. Hmm. So um, talk to us a little bit about um, filmmaking in uh, in Kenya, because I get a sense that um, at least the, the outcome or the the product is very different from what we see in West Africa. I haven't had the opportunity to watch a lot of Kenyan film, and I was really impressed with the quality of the film that you put out. Um, so for in, Ga in Ghana, for example, our heavy hitters are Lydia Forsen, um, Shirley from Pong Manso. They do really good quality, you know, at least visuals. So talk mm -hmm. to us about. Um, filmmaking in Kenya, do you feel like you're being supported by the government um, or, you know, or private persons to, to help the industry increase and do better? Uh, I will say the film industry in Kenya is uh, it's in its 
infant stages. It's still struggling like the rest of the African countries. And more so it's because people really haven't taken filmmaking as a career. You know, they don't take it as a business. They see it as a hobby, something you do after work, after 5 p.m. That's what you do. Go make your film. Then in the morning, go back to your normal job. So it's really haven't been given the right attention it deserves. But somehow, like um, like the film we've put out, the intellect has come. I think it's way, way, way above the average quality we have here in Kenya. And even in Africa in general, it's way above average. And the reason for that, it's more so of individuals who have helped us. And uh, I'll give you an example of a few friends that really came on board this project, and I have to mention by name, uh, the likes of Jim Bishop. Uh, he was the cinematographer, and he's really good at his job. Uh, I have to give big thanks to the likes of Dan Kent, uh, the editor of the film, the lead actor, the guy who played Walter. He's called Jason Coder. Really amazing people. And, you know, it was a whole blend of really experienced guy and students. We had lots of students, like the producer, his name is Bill Jones. He's a really good guy. We had Phoebe who really did a lot in the film. And, you know, it's more of individuals coming together and trying to make a difference other than the government really supporting us. There is really little support from the government. Mm. But in, in, in other countries like South Africa, I think, are really doing well. They have very quality films. I have watched several of them and they're really good. And so is Nigeria as much as, you know, not all of them are really to the, you know, top standard. They have select few that are really good, like an adaptation, Half of a Yellow Sun. I don't know whether you've watched it. I haven't I haven't had a chance to see Half of a Yellow Sun because I have 12 children, so I don't get to the movies that much. <laughs> but you couldn't go anywhere without hearing about Half of a Yellow Sun. And, you know, to your point, it was an excellently written book by Chimamanda. Um, you know, everybody that was in the film from, you know, from Chiwetel to Thandie Newton, yeah. you know, they were all excellent. So excellent, I think that yeah. that's encouraging well, as well. You know, we think... When I think about this project that you've taken on, Intellectual Scum, and I think about the cycle of how it, it, it came to happen. So you talk about Fanny Newton, who's from South Africa, Chiwetel, who's from Nigeria. Um, you know, the Pan-African aspect of it, people who, you know, may work abroad in Hollywood but come back, you know, to, to do something in African film is fantastic. And so me being from Ghana, Field being from Zambia, you being from Kenya, and telling what is really an African story, I think is pretty amazing. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And as as you tweeted before, it's the true Pan-African spirit. You know, an, an, a Kenyan, a, a Ghanaian, and a Zambian all seeing the truth in something and deciding to show with the whole world. So it's a big, big, big congratulations to Field for writing it to you for posting it on your blog and for the rest of people who are involved in in making in making Africa know about this so it's it's a collaboration between very many people we had help from uh, South Africa a friend who really helped us a lot we had a friend from Egypt who helped us review the script so it has the bits of everyone from everywhere in Africa which is I'm really proud of that that's fantastic. You had so many different people on board, you know, a, a script writer from Egypt and so forth. So about the, the script, how did it affect the, um, the actors in the films? What, what was some of their personal reactions to it? You know, you know, you see behind the scenes um, whenever you watch some of these major things. What kind of things, conversations were people having on your set after this was filmed? Uh, just before I answer that, we do actually have a behind the scenes. Uh, footage and clip and we'll be uploading it on the Vimeo channel so be on the lookout for that Absolutely. Uh, but to answer you the actors really really helped me as a director a lot because they really understood what story I wanted to tell you know it becomes difficult when you try to explain to someone the whole story and try to make them understand the whole point behind making the film but I, I really appreciate Phil uh, uh, sorry for that. I really appreciate Jason Coda and Patrick Oketch, who are the leading stars. They really understood the article and really brought it to life 
like I would like I wanted it to and like filled and visioned in his article. So we had a really good and easy time. You will see it from the from the behind the scenes footage. So what did Jason say? I'm interested. Jason is the the, the gentleman who plays Walter, the white man. Walter. Yes. Is he, was he bald or did you have to shave his head? Uh, he, he, I think he maintained his natural look. That's, you know, we really, we really casted the right person, I think, from the appearance. Uh, he really fitted to me as Walter. When I, when I first read the, the, the article and decided to make the film, he was the first guy that came to mind here in, Af here in Kenya. You know, I, I I didn't have the right resources or funds to outsource actors from you know from abroad and all that, so I had to look for actors here in Kenya. And he was the first person that came to mind, and he really did a good job in in the in in his performance. He's Walter. You will see it. He's Walter. Excellent. And then how about the the gentleman you casted as um as Field Ruiz? So. Is that somebody you know personally, um, or did you have to hold a casting call? Because obviously, you know, there are many black men. <laughs> Would it be so difficult to cast him? Uh, we didn't hold any open casting calls because I, I already had people in mind of who I would love to play the, the film, the characters in the film. So uh, the, the black guy in the film is known as Patrick. He, he's a personal friend, so I just called him up, told him, hey Patrick, I have a role that you could play really well, so will you be interested in playing it? And he absolutely agreed. So, um, one thing I've noticed is that this particular article, the most, as far as gender, reading how, you know, the different genders have, have reacted to it, I see a stronger reaction from men than I have from women. Um, women who have read it would be like, wow, you know, that's absolutely right. But more of the contention I have seen about it has come from men. You're a man. So tell me why you think that is. Uh, uh, well, of course I'm a man. <laughs> uh, the reason I think it really resonates with men is because the two lead characters are men. So I, I think it really touches more of men than women especially here in Africa because our leaders like I'm sure if you were to conduct statistics like 75% of the African leaders are male so I think that's one of the main reason why it really resonates with men uh, but you know in the film we tried to to bring females in and around uh, so we had a few hostess uh, flight attendants who are really pretty ladies so you know, try try to bring the balance to the film. I see. Um, and we're almost out of time, so I just want to ask yeah. you one last question. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the movie is called Intellectual Scum. Mm -hmm. Do you, what what practically can Africans who are intellectuals, whether they consider themselves intellectual or not. The, the truth is, once you've achieved a certain level of education or have a certain amount of privilege, you know, you are part of that, um, that class of intellectualism or elitism. What practical things can we do, whether we're on the continent or not, what can we do to stem this tide so that these aren't the sort of criticisms that, you know, a Walter or whoever can lobby against us? Because the truth is the truth. I mean, we haven't done a good job of educating people, of pulling, you know, the masses up behind us. Um, you know, we haven't done the whole trickle down, quote unquote, um, you know, work that needs to be done. So what practically do you think that we can do? Uh, I'll say personally, I think the number one thing that we'll do is uh, give education to everyone, not the education that, you know, hang your degrees on your walls and then go to your job 8 to 5. By education, I mean empowering people to their strength. So if someone is an actor, empower him or her. If someone is an engineer, empower them with the right knowledge, with the right skills. Uh, if someone is a musician, for example, empower them with the right knowledge and skills in their respective fields. And then as a whole, we are going to improve as Africa. Because I think we Africans, like our parents, uh, not my parents in particular, I'm just saying, 
appliance in general, I tend to say if you're not a doctor, if you're a not lawyer. a lawyer, yeah, if you're not a doctor or a lawyer, then you're not someone in the society, you know. So we need to change that mentality. We need to empower everyone in their specific fields. And I believe, as Walter says, we Africans are the hard, hardest working people on the planet. That's absolutely true. So if we were empowered in our specific fields, then we'll be a much better continent, if you ask me. Yeah, I absolutely agree. You know, and I, I am so proud of you and the work that you've done. Um, I only see you moving forward and doing better and greater things. Um, I hope that everybody who is watching this will tweet you um, good luck on your final exams. This is your final year, isn't it? Yeah, this is my final year, yes. <laughs> So yes, everyone wants to do a good luck on his final exams. <laughs> I, I, I need the good <laughs> luck. More films. <laughs> and thank you so much for time. your time. Did you have any final remarks you wanted to say? Well, of course, I, I have to say thank you, for you to you for hosting me. Uh, this is the first time I did an online interview. It's, it's been amazing, so thank you to you. Thank you to Field. Uh, I'm sure maybe he's watching this. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to make your article into a film and also thank you to all the filmmakers that were involved in making the film uh, we hope you're going we all going to get an Oscar someday our dreams are valid <laughs> <laughs> straight from Lupita's mouth <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah all right thank you so much and um, everybody who's watching have a fantastic day